Hi, this is Gilles, the Radio Prepper, and today I'm building the QRP Labs QCX Mini CW transceiver. So, it's a radio that uh, uses Morse code only. It's one band. I chose 40 meters. I'll get back to that later. It does come with quite a few surface mount components already uh, soldered on the board, so you don't have to worry about that. All the components you will put on are through hole components. Here you can see already soldered T1. So this is the main board. There's a second board that comes on for the uh, display and the, the controls. It does come with, well, you have to buy a neat little box here, a case, aluminum case, and you can see it's quite a small radio compared to the size of my hand. Very nice QRP portable radio. Excellent for uh, survival purposes, in my opinion. And I have to explain, of course, my choice of band and why CW. Now, I've done this in other videos, but I think it's quite important to uh, uh, go back to that subject. Uh, 40 meters is, as I called it before, the king of uh, prepping bands. Simply because it can do everything. You can do local communications regional communications uh, using NVIS, Near Vertical Incident Skywave, where you use a horizontally uh, strong antenna, which sends your signal straight up and it rains down basically uh, in a regional pattern of a few hundred miles. You can also use a vertical antenna, uh, in which case you have a takeoff angle that's much lower and you can get very long uh, distance communications transcontinental even uh, with a few watts and this outputs 5 watts so it's quite enough believe me for uh, DX you know long distance communications if need be and CW because of course it's in my opinion the, the most efficient mode uh, for a radio uh, it doesn't mean it's the uh, highest performance mode because now we have, of course, digital modes like JS8 call and you know modes like that that can decode uh, signals extremely uh, weak, uh, 24 decibels below the noise level, and that's absolutely incredible. But CW is simple. I, I would call it almost elegant, <laughs> and uh, it's basically to me it's the essence of radio, and it allows you to have. A radio that is quite quite small doesn't use much current so on small tiny batteries you know small battery pack 3 18 650 cells for instance uh, you can you know your radio will last quite a long time and that's very important when you don't have necessarily the means to recharge those batteries easily and on top of that of course you have to carry them so <laughs> that's another issue uh, lots of people uh, use portable radios that you know are not so portable uh, you know heavier uh, 100 watts uh, you have to use a big battery so uh, if you use digital mode you have to use a computer or a tablet CW the decoder is right here so <laughs> you don't have that uh, apparatus to uh, to carry a uh, lug around and that's why I find it so appealing because the small size, the, the lack of weight, and uh, the performance, basically. Uh, CW is uh, about 20 times more efficient than uh, voice modes like uh, SSB. So you have a big advantage here. And most of my radios are CW radio, Morse code only, because that's all you need. And if you know Morse code, if you put in the efforts to learn it and practice, you can use it uh, for... Uh, a lot of things and you can rely on it for communications of all distances. So let's start with the build. I'm not going to show you all the steps because of course it's boring. <laughs> you don't want to watch me build a kit uh, from A to Z. So I'll just stop on the uh, particulars of the kit if there are any difficulties that I find uh, like T1 for instance and uh, we'll see about other things. I'm just starting now. Let's get to it. So the first thing I did was uh, to completely mess up <laughs> the installation of T1. The winding wasn't right, I didn't have the right number of turns and it didn't come out the right way. I had to cut it out and uh, I really didn't like the, uh, the way it was explained in the manual. Although uh, Hans probably writes the best manuals I've ever seen and the most complete ones. 
but I guess we all have our ways to to think and uh, it just didn't make any sense to me the way it was explained with the big loops and uh, so I'm going to redo this, rewire it, redo the 38 turns here on this side and then do the uh, three separate five turn windings and I'll just do it my way, <laughs> I know it's going to work so here are my 38 turns, that's the beginning of the winding that comes on top of the torrid. I went this way, 38 turns, and it comes out under. Now I did my 5 turns here, making sure that I was winding in the same direction. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I have 2 more to do, twice 5 turns here the same way. And here it is. So yesterday I spent a couple hours actually struggling with the manual trying to understand and trying to do it right and maybe I was just tired maybe I'm getting older maybe I had a Brandon moment I don't know but <laughs> the way I did it today it was much easier for me it took about 10 minutes and uh, this will do perfectly fine what's pretty difficult here of course is to put the wires into the holes <laughs> that's not going to be easy at all uh, there are lots of them and uh, you have to do it one by one so on top of that I already partially obstructed the holes by messing up my soldering so I'm gonna have to get back to you on that you have to make sure you heat up those contacts long enough to burn the enamel or what's left of the enamel so to have uh, a good contact so I wait about 30 seconds here and that's quite a bit but that's what's needed and here's the difference between a good joint and a bad joint. This is the bad one. You can see that the solder really doesn't go around the wire. It really hasn't bonded with the wire here. It's just kind of going through it, but there's no contact, really, no good contact anyway. So there is still some enamel on that wire. So I'm going to have to scratch it up a bit with a blade and uh, re-solder it and maybe wait a little bit longer with the for the temperature to be high enough to melt the remaining enamel because this is not good all the rest of them are good but this one is not might have another look at this one but yeah it looks okay this one definitely not and by the way here's uh let's take the opportunity to look at the board a little more you know closer Look at how all the components are aligned properly. There are no components that are sideways, uh, like you can see sometimes. They are all uh, perfectly uh, parallel or perpendicular, so very good quality soldering on the board. There is a big ground plane all around, so all these areas here, the green areas, are ground, and that's great. It does soak up a lot of heat, so sometimes for soldering uh, you have to wait a little bit longer because the heat is dissipated, but this is a very high quality board, guys. All right, so now we have a good contact, and it was this one. As you can see, the solder has flowed on the, uh, on the wire itself, and it's, there is a bond here, and there wasn't before. The uh, pads that I have access to, so these here on the outside, not those on the inside, but not this one over there either, but those three, four pads here, I'm also going to solder on the other side of the board just to make sure that uh, there is really a good contact. All right, so most of the uh, components are on the board. Actually, this kit is fairly simple. I thought it would be harder, but the fact that all the uh, surface mounted components are already in place, there is no real difficulty uh, so far. I'm going to solder Q6 here and I'm going to drop a little bit of uh, conductive uh, grease here under the transistor. Just a tiny drop and uh, it's just to help cooling basically. By the way, don't touch that stuff with your fingers. It's uh, carcinogenic. Here we go. The smallest amount possible. I uh, did the same for the three uh, BS170 MOSFETs. And uh, I have them on many kits from uh, Hans and Steve Weber. Maybe I should buy some spares, but I really never had one go bad, even uh, transmitting accidentally without an antenna for a few seconds. So they are pretty resilient transistors. There's a washer that's going to come on top here and uh, pin them against the board. Something that you really have to pay attention to is the manual. 
here for instance at the base of those potentiometers you have to cut off the little tabs plastic tabs here and I did that but you also have to cut the little tabs at the bottom of this potentiometer here on the uh, display board which I forgot to do so now I have to unsolder this cut the tabs here at the base and resolder it and that's a real pain one thing that I had to do was to file the opening here a little bit so that the uh, control board would just go through the uh, through the hole also when you assemble the two boards you notice that uh, there is a capacitor here and this capacitor is very close to the pins here so I had to file those uh, those leads here so that they don't didn't touch the top of the uh, of the capacitor and it's a good idea to look around and see if nothing touches uh, once you press the two boards together I can't stress enough that it is very important that uh, you read the manual very carefully while building this kit because there are things that you need to do that uh, if you don't pay attention you're going to make some mistakes like I did forgetting to cut the, the tabs below this uh, potentiometer for instance that will cost you a lot of time and frustration uh, which it did but now it's time for the smoke test. I always use a dummy load while powering up a kit for the first time even though of course it's not supposed to go into transmit when you turn it on but you never know so better be safe than sorry so I have this 50 ohm dummy load here and I'm gonna turn it on. Now I haven't done this before this is the first time I'm gonna power it up so you'll discover just at the same time as I do if it's working or not or if it's gonna smoke. Let's do it. Okay, uh, well, seems like the brightness is way too high, but uh, let's uh, get a screwdriver and change that. Probably this one. Of course, I haven't checked the manual, which I should have. Oh, yep, there we go. Select band. So there's 160 meters, 80 meters, and 60, 40 meters. Okay, which button do I press? Which has pressed the left button. Okay, now I'll do the uh, tuning procedure. Now this uh, kit has all the tuning tools that you need. You do not need any uh, external uh, measuring equipment. So I'm not going to film all that. That's all in the manual and we'll get back when I'm finished. For the alignment, there are three little potentiometers here and you have to set those three and they interact between each other. I must have gone through the loop a couple of hundred times. I'm not even sure it's set properly, but I'm going to plug in my antenna, my uh, magnetic loop, and uh, we'll see what happens. The keyer works, so all I have to do now is see if uh, there is any reception and any uh, transmission. Actually, I'm going to plug in my watt meter. Oh, that's bad news. I don't see any power output whatsoever. Guess what? I just switched cables. Yep, it works. Ah, incredible. I'm going to throw that one away. All right, so I have the kit here. We are the uh, cold device. And uh, I had some trouble with tuning the uh, three potentiometers that you have to uh, to tune together, you know, uh, for the IQ, IQ balance and the other things. Uh, it's just, I had a very hard time. And uh, the uh, you're supposed to uh, turn the potentiometers so that you get, you know, the minimum value on the bar graph there's a bar graph you have those bars and you have to make them as low as possible but it was only moving by two or three bars and that's it so i tried to do it as best i could i'm not sure it's going to work i did hear some stations i do have some power coming out so who knows i'm going to plug it in the antenna here the uh, par and fed and uh, see if i can make a contact but i have some suspicions about uh, sideband suppression so We'll see.
this is the same guy that I heard on 7016 so I am definitely receiving two sidebands and that's not a good sign so the radio works fine uh, it's a great little radio I really like it I really enjoy it and uh, 40 meters is the best band really but there is a problem with uh, sideband suppression obviously and uh, I need to fix that I'm not quite sure how to, how to go by it I don't have an oscilloscope I don't have I just have a multimeter so I'm just a kit builder I'm not a designer and uh, I'm not very good at troubleshooting so if someone can uh, has any idea of what to do uh, <laughs> I'm a taker. Uh, I'm listening, so uh, I could use the help. Um, I don't know what to do. I'll go on to the uh, QRP Labs uh, group on uh, groups.io and uh, see if I can get some help there. Maybe on Facebook and uh, see if I can uh, find a way to suppress that sideband. I mean, I could use it like that, just uh, make sure I'm on the lower sideband. But that's really not, not a good way to go and I might be transmitting on two sidebands. So I'm going to try to send a CQ, see if I have any result on the uh, reverse beacon network. Maybe I'll be spotted on two different frequencies, I'm not sure. I'll try it and see what happens. But It looks like when I'm transmitting on 7030, I'm actually reported on 7031.1. Very weird. All in all, very happy with this kit and uh, you'll see it again, uh, hopefully fixed next time. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this, uh, nothing special really, but uh, just kit building, you know, it's the season for that and uh, it's a great little uh, radio. Maybe I should build some more. Have a good one.